simpler materials can bring new perspectives to the area of quantum criticality. Uh, today will be a pedagogical talk, and the idea is to go over uh, some, some specifics and to also uh, give some historical perspective to some work that was already done, and then to talk about current challenges. Next time, I'll talk about two research projects in this area, just to give you a flavor for what's possible. Now, the connection between polar materials and quantum criticality is not at all obvious. Polar materials, in fact, the simplest kinds, are ferroelectrics. And ferroelectrics are mostly insulating, and they're usually studied towards specific room temperature applications. By contrast, the crucial stimulus for the study of quantum criticality and quantum phase transitions, that is where zero point fluctuations, not thermal fluctuations, melt the long range order, is often the link with novel metallic phases and unconventional superconductivity. So in what way are these two topics related? Well, stay tuned and I hope to give you a sense of that. First of all, we'll unpack the title. Because these are two rather different topics, we'll review quantum criticality and in particular develop the skill set we'll need to address some of the recent experiments. Then we'll also talk about polar materials and in particular we'll focus on the simplest type, ferroelectrics, and we'll discuss them. Now why bring them together? There are plenty of quantum critical materials and in fact we'll hear about uh, state-of-the-art experiments later on this week from uh, uh, our colleague Met Megan Aronson. Why do we need more? Well, if you want, if you believe as many of us do that there's some universality here, the more settings the better. First of all, and second of all you'll find, you'll, I hope to show you that polar materials, uh, particularly ferroelectrics, reside at their upper critical dimension, and therefore one has the possibility of detailed interplay between theory and experiment and dimensional tuning, both below, at, and above the critical dimension. Then I'd like to give you some historical perspective with modern eyes on work that was done in this area some time ago, mostly theoretical, and now bring you up to date with some very exciting experiments and some current challenges in this field. Uh, today, the work that I'll be discussing will be review. And for those of you who are interested in more details and in particular more references, there's this ROPP article that I wrote with my co experimental colleagues, Joe Lonswich, Stephen Raleigh, and Jim Scott. And I'm indebted tremendously to them for teaching me about this exciting topic. Though, of course, any errors I make are my own. All right. so. Let's begin. Let's start with what does quantum critical mean? This is a question I get a lot from the ferroelectrics community. Aren't quantum fluctuations only important at t equals zero? So why are we even talking about that? We can't do any measurements at t equals zero. Well, I'll remind you of this wonderful phrase by the great theoretical physicist, Sidney Coleman. The career of a young theoretical physicist consists of treating the harmonic oscillator in every increasing levels of abstraction. Now, we all like to think of ourselves as young, young in spirit. So let's go back to the good old harmonic oscillator. Okay, so a simple harmonic oscillator in 1D. The variance, as you see here, is equal to the oscillator frequency over the stiffness times the Bose, con uh, Bose function plus a half. And here, of course, I'm taking h bar equals to one and kb equals to one as a, a good theorist. I should mention that once coming into New York airport, when I told them I was a physicist, they immediately asked me, what's the speed of light? And I realized the answer C equals one was not going to fly. So I had to delve back into my high school physics to remember what the units were. But as I won't be going to any airports recent to right now, I don't, I'm going to keep these units all to be one. Okay, so this is a simple harmonic oscillator. So let's make a plot of the variance times 
versus temperature. Well, we know that when T is very large compared to the oscillator frequency, then this Bose term looks like T over omega. The omegas cancel. And thermal fluctuations are just, uh, the variance just goes as T over the stiffness. Okay, So that we know very well. So that's all the way up here. What happens at T equals 0? Well, at T equals 0, this is 0. We just have pure quantum fluctuations. And then the variance goes as the frequency over 2 uh, times the stiffness. That 3 here is just the page number times the stiffness. You notice in both cases, the stiffnesses are on the bottom. So these are in the two extreme examples with temperature very high and with temperature very low. And you notice that in the quantum limit, the oscillator frequency becomes important. That tells us that for quantum fluctuations, dynamics are important. But dynamics are not important for thermal fluctuations. Okay? And we know very well that if we want to calculate thermodynamic functions uh, at a classical phase transition, we don't have to usually worry about, about dynamics. However, at a quantum phase transition, we do have to worry about that. And of course, uh, it depends when we, what's important is this omega compared to, to T. But what happens in between? Well, in between, we have both in this region between zero and the oscillator free and uh, omega, we have both thermal and quantum fluctuation. Okay. And that's going to be very, very important because that's going to be where our experimentalists are, and that's going to be where we're going to be interested in making contact with observable properties. Okay. Now you might say, okay, what does the behavior of a, a simple harmonic oscillator have to do with phase transitions and criticality? Why are you telling me this? Well, remember that at a phase transition, order parameter fluctuations play a very important role. And we can consider the variance of each of the Fourier trends of each of the Fourier components one by one and map them each onto a simple um, harmonic oscillator with amplitude x and, fre and, and frequency omega for, uh, for each specific mode. Now, at a continuous phase transition, the stiffness goes to zero and the variance diverges. This can happen at a classical phase transition, but it can also happen at a quantum phase transition. Okay, so the quantum fluctuations increase and the amplitude fluctuations increase at low temperatures. Now, you might say, wait a minute, wait a minute. I remember from my solid state physics class that there was the Einstein Debye model of the specific heat, and that quantum fluctuations were reduced in the specific heat from a classical value. And this was a big success for quantum theory. How does this work? You're telling me the quantum fluctuations are getting larger. Well, remember that for a simple harmonic oscillator, the energy scales like the variance. So the specific heat uh, then will be like the slope. And if you look, the slope at high temperatures, it's much higher than the slope at low temperatures. And that's in some sense what's going on, that the specific heat at high temperatures, it's much higher. And of course, uh, and this is for diamond, if I look at the specific heat as a function of temperature, the classical value, the Dulong Petit value, uh, which is, uh, uh, is flat, but of course the specific heat uh, comes down, and that's because this slope is much is smaller than here. Now, another point I want to make here, and this is for diamond, uh, we have the effect of quantum fluctuations at room temperature, okay, without any cryogenics. So the point is that in diamond, the effects of quantum fluctuations are there at room temperature, and it's possible that quantum fluctuations are important at finite temperatures, and that's what we're going to be interested in. Those are the quantum fluctuations that are important in this area here. Okay, now 
How do we think about temperature near a quantum critical point? Okay. Now, temperature at a quantum critical point is not a tuning parameter, all right? We're going to tune the zero point fluctuations with pressure, with strain, with chemical doping, but temperature is not. But rather, temperature is like a boundary effect. So let's think about this in terms of something we know so well, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, we have the uncertainty in time is proportional to one over the uncertainty in energy. This tells us then that the decoherence time is proportional to one over T. So the fluctuations are purely quantum up to the time scale of this decoherence time and classical beyond that. Now you see that as T goes to zero, the decoherence time diverges. But the decoherence time is actually finite at finite temperatures and in fact, quantum fluctuations are usually important up to temperatures of order the phonon temperatures, so the Debye temperature. Okay, so that's a key difference between quantum fluctuations at a, at, a, at a quantum transition and classical fluctuations near a classical phase transition. So again, we have a decoherence time, and this de decoherence time scales like one over the temperature. All right. So let's go back to the quantum, to the simple harmonic oscillator, okay? Um, right now, we're just gonna develop a simple toolbox to address some of the questions later on we're gonna ask. And in particular, we're going to be interested in making contact with observable properties near a quantum phase transition. So let's go back to the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so once again, the order parameter fluctuations, we can consider each Fourier mode as a simple harmonic oscillator with a, an amplitude, amplitude fluctuations, and this is for each Q, and, with, and uh, with an oscillator frequency. Now, we know for a harmonic oscillator that we have this particularly simple power spectrum, the imaginary part of the response, and so that tells us that we can relate the variance of the amplitude fluctuations to the imaginary part of response. Now we've shown this for the uh, harmonic oscillator, but of course one can show this much more generally. And this is what is usually called the fluctuation dissipation theorem or the Nyquist theorem. So here we have the variance and it's related to the imaginary part of the response. So now, we can generalize this to all modes in the Brion zone. So we're going to look, let's take phi, uh, which is an order parameter. In our case, it'll be a dipole moment. And we can, we're going to consider it to be a scalar order parameter. And we can look at the order parameter variance uh, where we're summing over all modes in the Brion zone. And uh, so this is, our, uh, this is our expression for the variance based on what we just did. So let's have, again, a scalar order parameter. We can consider it as an average plus fluctuations, where, of course, the, this is zero, but the higher order terms are going to be important. And let's just take the simplest case. We're treating simplest cases now. The propagating limit, though, of course, other power spectra are important. And our focus will be this we're going to go after what we want to compare to experiment because one of the key aspects of uh, quantum critical polar materials is we can have very good interplay between theory and experiment. We are going to be interested in the strongest temperature dependent contribution to this variance. So we are going to be interested not so much in this term, okay? We're going to be interested in the strong temperature dependent contribution to observables coming into the quantum critical point, okay? So this is going to be our main effort because our, our focus is going to be to determine the temperature dependence of observables. So how do we do that? Well, we talked about the fact that the frequency was important near a quantum phase transition. Now we've been considering harmonic oscillators, but of course, 
in real systems, we've got dispersions. And so let's look at a system where we have omega versus Q, and here we have a dis dispersion Q to the Z. As it turns out, in ferroelectric Z is just one, okay? But let's just do this generally. And let's look at the energy scales, of course, and the wave vector scales. Of course, we have the Brouillon uh, zone, and that's QBZ. But we also have something called QT. What is QT? Well, we know that quantum fluctuations are important as long as omega is greater than T. So then we can define a wave vector QT such that T it scales like Q to the Z. That's right here, when omega and, uh, is proportional to T. So that tells us that QT is proportional to T to the one over Z. So once again, we have our dispersion here. We know that quantum fluctuations will be important at, uh, at frequencies greater than T. And so for T of order omega, then we have T of order Q to the Z. And so we get QT of order one over Z. Okay, I should point out that one over QT is a generalized de Broglie wavelength. Uh, the de Broglie wavelength, of course, is for free electrons with essentially z equals two. Here we have a one over t QT will be a generalized de Broglie wavelength, which incorporates the, the, uh, the dynamical exponent um, associated with the dispersion. So now let's look at what we have. If QBZ is less than QT, so if QT is all the way up here, then we have purely classical fluctuations. Remember, everything up to QT is classical, everything beyond QT is quantum, okay? So if QT is greater than QZ, BZ, which it would be for high temperatures, then all we do is we, all, we notice that all the modes across the Brunion zone are excited and we have purely classical fluctuations. On the other hand, if QT, as it is for lower temperatures, is less than QBZ, then quantum fluctuations are present, okay? So we'll only excite some of the thermal modes in the Brouillon zone, and QT will tell us, and QT will scale as one over Z. All right, so now let's, gener let's go back. We're generalizing all the modes in the Brouillon zone. Our focus, once again, is on the strongest temperature dependence of the variance. And once again, we're building, this, uh, we're building the toolbox to be able to make contact with observables. So let's first look at T much greater than omega. Um, and here, we already know the result, but we'll do it anyway. Here then we can use, uh, we can use uh, Cromer's coding and we have T, we have, we can bring, this goes as T over omega, we use Cromer's Kronig, omega, the imaginary uh, part of the susceptibility over omega. And so we have a sum Q less than QBZ all the way across, we've excited all the uh, thermal, all the uh, thermal modes in the Brouillon zone and we have our uh, susceptibility, okay? So this is what we already know. Now what happens when we take the other limit? when T is much, much less than omega Q, and Q is less than QT. Well, interesting enough, if we work this out, we have to separate this integral into two parts, zero to T and T to omega. We separate this integral into two parts, and what we find when we go through it all is that the strongest temperature dependence that crops up goes like T, and now we're not gonna sum all the way up to the Brouillon zone, we're only going to sum the thermal modes up to QT, and once again, we have the susceptibility. For more details about that, I, can, uh, I refer you to our RPP article, but the point is that now you see that the dynamical exponent is gonna show up through this QT, okay? Now, of course, the, here we have an inverse susceptibility, which goes like kappa, squared plus Q squared, and so chi inverse goes like kappa squared, right? Good, 
So that will set up with us up with enough tools to later make connection with experiment. So now let's switch gears for a moment, okay? Let's talk about the simplest polar materials. We're starting very simple, okay? So a simple polar material is a ferroelectric, a ferroelectric is a material that has a spontaneous polarization that it's switchable by an electric field of practical magnitude. Now, just to remind you, we have ferroelectrics, we have pyroelectrics. Pyroelectric is a system where you can get, develop a, a um, polarization, which is this polarization, with a temperature change, it usually has a rather, um, usually you can't switch the polarization because you'll break the crystal before you do that. That's a key practical difference between a pyroelectric and a ferroelectric. A piezoelectric is when you can uh, apply a, a voltage and you get a, a displacement. Those are used a lot, particularly in micro machines. And of course, you know, dielectrics and, um, in ferroelectrics, you have P versus E, and you have a hysteresis curve very similar to what you have in magnets. I should say that despite the fact that we have ferro here, most ferroelectrics do not have iron. I should also emphasize that the polarization is relative. It's measured by integrating the charge, the current, and so absolute polarization you don't have, but you have relative. Okay, now, the key thing is that most ferroelectrics are due to ionic, have ionic displacements and have very strong electromagnet, electromechanical coupling. Okay, and this is used quite a bit in particular, for example, for transducers, you apply a voltage, you get a displacement, that's all wonderful. And ferroelectrics are used for a lot of room temperature applications. Uh, they're used, for example, for thermal infrared switches. Their piezoelectrics are used as actuators. Uh, most infrared direct detectors are pyroelectrics. Um, a new use of ferroelectrics, which I just learned about, is it turns out that ferroelectrics are, though they're not that fast, it, it, the memories are not fast compared to semiconductor memories. They are cosmically hard. That means that cosmic rays don't affect them and I have, I hear anecdotally that Elon Musk on his Falcon X actually uses some sort of ferroelectric memory there. So there are all kinds of use for that. That's not room temperature, that's low temperature. But anyway, there are lots of uses for ferroelectrics. Okay, now the poster child of ferroelectric, ferroelectrics, particularly perovskite ferroelectrics, is barium titanate and it was used a lot and in fact it Bell Labs uh, in the 70s it was a fierce contender for, for uh, memory though it was beat out by magnetic bubble of memory. Well a close cousin of barium titanate is strontium titanate. Strontium titanate is isovalent to barium titanate. It's very it's similar structurally and yet it's not a ferroelectric. This was uh, studied by Muller and Buchhard in, in the 70s. And in fact, they, this is some old data from them. The dielectric constant goes up, up, up. This is one over the dielectric constant, but it never quite goes ferroelectric, okay? It sort of peters out at the end, okay? Uh, the, um, the, the polar mode is due to the displacement of this titanium, which is very similar to barium titanate that does go ferroelectric. However, strontium titanate, uh, in strontium titanate, ferroelectricity can be induced very, very easily by uniaxial stress, calcium, and oxygen 18 substitution. So it's so weakly non ferroelectric that if you uh, take oxygen 16 and and instead replace it by oxygen 18, you get a ferroelectric, okay? So strontium titanate is a system that's been studied very well. These days it's used uh, a lot as substrates. And, um, and we're, as we'll see, it's now coming into its four. It was the sort of badly behaved cousin, but we're gonna see that the badly behaved cousin has done good. All right, so, most recently, the Cambridge group, uh, Stephen Raleigh, Jim Scott, and uh, Gil Lonzerich, um, 
did some magnificent measurements revisiting the strontium titanate, uh, going to much lower temperatures than was done before. And they found that in fact, yes, the dielectric function, the dielectric susceptibility does diverge, does not diverge. It sort of goes here, if we look at one over the susceptibility, it goes up at the very last moment, it doesn't go straight down. But they said, well, wait a minute, this could be a system to study a quantum criticality because we can nudge it towards a quantum critical point. Uh, we can nudge it, for example, with oxygen 18 substitution. It's a system that couples strongly. It's compressible, so we can apply pressure, which is, of course, their big forte there. And why don't we think about, rethink quantum critical for electricity? So this study really brought us back into, all of us, into revisiting the notion of quantum critical for electricity. And I'll give the full reference when I have a little bit more space. So then you can say, wait a minute. Okay, you still haven't told me, what do ferroelectrics have to do with quantum criticality? You've just said that they're mostly insulators. And so what's the link to novel metals and superconductivity? And furthermore, you've also told me, due to the- me, Premi, we have a yes. question. Oh, sure. Jim from Yusha. Uh, yes. Sorry, Premi, just ask for clarification. So if- Sure. If, if, Can you speak a bit louder, please? Yes. So if it would order, if, if it would be a, a ferroelectric transition on the one over epsilon uh, plots, what would I see? Uh, it would, oh, sorry. If it did order, this would go to, this would go to zero all the way down. That wouldn't be critical? That would be, that would be ordering? No, it's not ordering. It would be critical. It would but go like this. This is, or, this is, uh, this is not ordering. Okay. The point is that we, we're interested, because we're interested in the quantum phase transition, we're interested in this coming all the way down. And so, so, what, we'll, what we'll see is when they, when they add oxygen 18 substitution, it will start to do that. So it would, if it would order, it would bend uh, downwards. Not, that's not right, down. that's right. Okay, okay. thanks. Uh, are there any other questions? Thanks, Yashar. Andrew, any other questions? I don't see any more at the moment. Okay, well, then I'll ask questions to myself. Uh, what do ferroelectrics have to do with quantum criticality? And please uh, ask questions as, uh, as much as possible. There are lots of questions. I have more questions than answers as usual. So once again, ferroelectrics are insulators. So what's their link? Second, classical ferroelectric transitions are usually first order. So why are you even bothering with me? However, there are many experiments that suggest that we do have quantum criticality. So this is an issue that we have to worry about. Then you might say, well, we have many, many magnetic settings to study quantum criticality. Why do we need more? Uh, here we have beautiful anti-ferromagnetic uh, critical point. We have non-fermi liquid. We also have uh, an, an uh, insulating system, uh, lithium holmium fluoride that was studied quite very much by uh, Gabe Epley and Tom Rosenbaum and their collaborators. And this is a beautiful system. Interesting enough, there are not that many insulating magnetic systems that can be studied at quantum criticality. That's something my experimental colleagues tell me. Okay, so one of the advantages of these ferroelectrics is that you have very simple propagating dynamics. So you have few degrees of freedom. And as we'll see, they also live at their marginal dimension. Now, speaking of marginal dimension, I'd like to just bring your attention, and now we're going to take a, uh, a historical perspective to the important role that ferroelectrics played in classical critical phenomena. And many people aren't aware of this. So in 1969, Larkin and Pitkin, uh, not Larkin and Pitkin, Larkin and, uh, sorry, Tolia Larkin and Dima Kamenitsky did the first calculation of logarithmic corrections to mean field theory in what we now call as the marginal dimension. And they did this in uniaxial ferroelectrics and it was subsequently, uh, uh, it was subsequently though some time afterwards observed. So let me just give you a flavor for how this works. And this may give you a sense of some of the magic of ferroelectrics. 
So if we have a uniaxial ferroelectric, for example, a tetragonal ferroelectric, the effective dimension is actually the spatial dimension plus one. And let me give you a flavor for how this works. All the dipoles in a uniaxial ferroelectric, remember we have dipolar interactions. Well, let's say that all the dipoles are in the Z direction. Then you can show that this adds an additional term to the transverse optical phonon dispersion. That's the, by the way, it's a transverse optical phonon that goes soft in these systems. So we have omega squared of Q, and then we have the usual term, this is a gap, and we have this new term, beta is just a constant, QZ squared over Q squared, that comes from here. Now, let's do an application of very simple scaling. Let's see if we can argue self-consistently that this term is small. So we're gonna assume that Q squared is just QX squared plus QY squared, so the other term is not so important. And now we're gonna do scaling, okay? We're gonna say this, this term is gonna scale as QX, QY over B, but now QZ is gonna scale to QZ over BK, where K is greater than one. And then what we're going to ask is how this constant B flows to long wave, it flows to infinity to the infrared fixed point. Well, it turns out that if we want to simultaneously satisfy one and two, we have to K take K equals two. So in a uniaxial ferroelectric, QZ counts for effectively two dimensions. And Larkin and Kamenitsky realized this. And so what they did was they said, let's take a uniaxial ferroelectric. It's in what we now call the marginal dimension. Let's calculate the specific heat. And that's what they did. They calculated, you have log terms, of course, and they made a prediction for the specific heat, which was eventually seen experimentally. And that was a, a, a very important development in uh, classical critical theory. So once again, why study for what, let's say, let's take these materials and look at what, how they behave at low temperatures. Well, there's a quest for universality. Of course, if we do believe that there might be universality of quantum criticality, we need as many settings as possible. There's a simplicity. They have very few degrees of freedom with propagating dynamics. And in principle, we can add additional degrees of freedom, uh, for example, charge and spin, and there might be possible applications. Okay, well, it turns out this has been thought of before, not surprisingly. Uh, there's this beautiful paper by Register in 1971. He talked to Kamenitsky and Larkin and asked what would happen at a second order phase transition at low temperatures. And so uh, there was a little bit of data, not much. He did a rather muscular parquet diagram calculation, um, which is fine in uh, the marginal dimension. And what he found was that the susceptibility, inverse susceptibility going into the quantum phase transition should scale like T squared. I remind you, of course, that it, the Curie susceptibility uh, chi in, inverse goes like T. Here he's saying it should go like T squared, okay? So this was, uh, unfortunately, the data at the time, he looked at the data at the time, but there wasn't enough data to really compare to this. But this is what he predicted. And according to what uh, Dima told me, uh, there's a, another paper by, uh, uh, by Kaminitsky and Schneerson where they actually did some further calculations. And from what I understand, Larkin basically told them, look, this is a bit of a theoretical exercise, but why don't you just work it out? They didn't have that much experiment, okay? But this paper did exist. And this was, I think, one of the first, um, and this was one of the first papers that calculated, did a calculation of an observable quantity close to the quantum critical point. Well, I probably we have a question sure. in the chat. Sure. Um, can the ferroelectricity survive in a metal? Uh, we're going um, so to get can to the ferroelectricity survive in a metal? That's a, a, an excellent question. It's one that was asked by Phil Anderson, actually, um, at Bell Labs, Anderson Blount. In a metal, of course, we're going to have screening, 
But Anderson and Blount said we can have a very interesting polar metal where you have an inversion symmetry breaking transition just as you would at a ferroelectric transition, but no spontaneous mo dipole moment. And indeed, one of, the comment, one of the projects that I'm going to tell you about next time is on such polar, quantum critical polar metals. And at the end of today's talk, we're going to, I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the polar metals. So I hope that addresses that question. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, so- Seems to be it for now. Okay, thank you. And, and please interrupt me at any time. Um, so the situation changed dramatically with this nice paper by the Cambridge group. And um, what they found was uh, they, they went to, they, they uh, started taking strontium titanate and they looked at what happens when you dope it with uh, oxygen 18, or when you substitute, sorry, oxygen 18 for oxygen 16. Uh, strontium titanate by itself is here. As you go towards the ferroelectric transition, you don't want to go too far, but you want to go closer to the quantum critical point. And what they're finding, what they find is that it's getting uh, closer and closer to the quantum critical point. And, and you can see that TC is getting better and better. Okay, so they've done some tremendous experiments and this really got the field activated. Okay, because now we have the possibility of interacting with experiments. Okay, so one of the questions we can ask then is, look, not all of us want to go through this very heroic parquet diagram uh, series. Is there a simpler way to get the fact that the inverse susceptibility should go like T squared? Okay, and in particular, of course, we want to, we want to uh, make contact with previous experiments and then to predict some new ones. But if we can't make contact with previous experiments, we're not worth our salt. Now, one of the nice things about being in the upper critical dimension is you can exploit that. You can come in from above and do a self-consistent mean field theory, and you can come up from below and do a scaling theory. Of course, you'll have logarithmic corrections, but most likely those will not be observable experimentally and we'll have a pretty good sense of, what, of what's going on. So let's come in from above. We're going to do a self-consistent Lando approach, okay? Phi here is going to be the dipole moment. I'll just call it moment, dipole moment, okay? Now remember that when we do a Landau theory, we're coarse graining. And we're coarse graining, this is a symmetry-based approach where we're coarse graining of macroscopic properties near phase transition. Now here we're going to be considering length scales uh, greater or equal to one over QT. Okay, remember QT. That's the relevant wavelength. We're going to assume that the main effects of our zero point fluctuations are absorbed in these coefficients. So we're not that interested in that because we want temperature dependent properties. And at the order parameter fluctuations due to thermal to temperature will then show up. So let's do a self-consistent Lando approach. Now we can minimize this. And this is of course a field and like an electric field conjugate to our order parameter. We can minimize this, but this is from this equation, we're just going to get the most probable uh, value of phi. Okay. Now, we have to be careful here because the most probable value of phi is the one that maximizes the probability distribution. But the observed moment requires fluctuation averaging due to the coarse grading over QT. Remember, we're, we have mesoscopic coarse grading. So we take phi to phi average plus delta phi. We're going to look at, uh, we're going to have some a Langevin term and we look at the variance here. Now, we can Fourier transform this in the limit that uh, epsilon goes to zero. And what we find then is that the inverse susceptibility takes this form. And again, we look at the most probable versus average values and we can coarse grain over QT. And what we get after out of all of this is that the limit as kappa squared goes, uh, uh, T goes to zero 
and will be it goes like this uh, the variance the te strongly temperature dependent variance of our order parameter now here you can oops here you can see why we have to worry because normally when would you lend a uh, theory, you know, for example, classical phase transition, we're interested in Q very small. So in that case, the most probable and the average values are very similar. However, here we have to be careful because we want to, our average value is involved with course grading over QT. Another way of saying this is if we want the equation of state, we have to do it, we have to do averaging over the most probable case. Okay, and that's what we're doing here. Okay, so what we have, and I should emphasize that this is only true close to uh, t equals zero transition at finite temperatures, you have additional terms. Okay, so what do we have here? We have kappa squared is proportional to, now we know that this is going to be t, which is out here, susceptibility. Now we can, since all we're interested in is the t dependence, we can just uh, replace this by an integral that goes from kappa to qt, q to the d minus 1 over q squared. We can do power counting and look what we get. Now, the temptation is to say that the inverse susceptibility just goes like k squared, which goes like this turns into d to the d plus z minus 2 over z, because remember that qt goes as t to the 1 over z. However, that's just neglecting this term. And are we allowed to do that? It's a little tricky because both kappa and qt, uh, are we allowed, how do they go to zero as t goes to zero? When is this approach valid? Well, we okay. can re- Apparently yes. we have a question. Um, sure. In the chat, um, which says beta is not temperature dependent. Where? Um, I guess on this slide. Which um, one? The, the question. Oh, no, sorry. Um, I'm beta, not sure which one, I'm assuming. It. Oh, here. Beta, yeah, so sorry. In the Landau theory, yes. So for example, in the Landau theory, so the, in the, uh, the alpha. T4 time, the beta is yeah, temperate dependent. So that this expansion is near the, uh, the phase transition. Well, actually, the, he, he, here, alpha, yeah, alpha is temperature dependent, not beta. Yeah, yeah, so the beta, the alpha, that's right. Yeah, I'm sorry. Alpha is, sorry. is, alpha mm -hmm. is uh, I'm sorry. Alpha is going to be temperature dependent. Beta is not. Sorry about the notation. And so here, when I go from this to that, I'm taking alpha going to zero. Yeah, so this, this expansion is valid near the critical point. When the free energy is, ex the Landau theory, the free energy is expanded near the critical point. That's, that's correct. So in this case, so this means that... Uh, the alpha dependence is linear, uh, temperature dependence, alpha has a linear. Yeah, I've taken alpha, I've done the very simplest thing of just saying it, it, it is linear, yes. Okay, okay, thank you. And I'm just taking, at, the, at this point it doesn't really matter because as t goes to zero, alpha goes to, this term goes to zero. Okay. okay. And I'm sorry about the beta, I realize beta, that, okay, but what I've done is, I, this is, I've just taken, as I go towards the transition, it's this term that's most important. I'm taking Q going to zero. And so this is what I do here. Okay, any other questions? Okay, thank you for the question. Uh, so when I look at this, the temptation is just to throw this out and to say uh, T D plus Z minus two over Z. When can I do that is the question. Well, I can rearrange this. So I've rearranged it here. And I can show then that the limit of kappa over qt goes to zero if in fact the, the d effective is d plus z, which is greater than four. Okay, so if d plus z is greater than four, then I'm safe as t goes to zero uh, because this will go to zero, okay? Now, in a ferroelectric, of course, we have d equals three, z equals one, we're in the marginal dimension. But then I have the uh, inverse susceptibility goes like kappa squared. I just showed that that goes like d, t to the d plus z minus two, and I get t squared. And of course, there'll be log terms also, which I haven't worried about. But right now, I just wanted to get registers result. So that agrees with the previous calculation by different methods. Now let's come from below. Let's look 
do some scaling. Again, this is, uh, you know, we're taking advantage of the fact that we're at the uh, marginal dimension. Now, I remind you that near a, we talked about the fact that temperature is a boundary effect near a quantum critical point. What we're after here are the temperature dependencies of our observables. So near a, let me just remind you that near a classical critical point, how do we handle boundaries? Well, suppose we have a classical critical system and we put it in a box, okay? We put it in a box of size L. What do we expect, for example, for the susceptibility? Well, remember, near a classical critical system, the correlation length goes as t to the minus mu. Our susceptibility will usually goes as t to the minus gamma. Uh, now we'll have a function that is L over psi. And of course, psi goes as t to the minus uh, mu. So for now, for L much, much less than psi, psi better just be a function of L. It can't know about the the correlation length. It better be a function of the box. So usually this is taken to a quantity to some power, but in order for this to just be a function of the length, we take this power to be gamma over nu so that we get susceptibility goes like L gamma over nu. Okay, we can do exactly the same thing with time. We can say psi goes as g, g is the tuning parameter minus mu, okay. This gives us a correlation time. I remind you that omega goes like Q to the Z. So the dimensions of the correlation time are going to be related to the correlation length to the Z. So this gives us that. Our box size in time is the decoherence time, uh, one over T. And we can go through, I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I realize I'm running out of time. So it's the same idea. Of course, you'll have these slides but psi goes as g to the minus gamma. Um, and what we can do is we can say, look, let's put this in a box, a time box of size L psi. This has to be to some power and we have to make this power so that the susceptibility is not a function of the correlation, this correlation time, but is a function of L and we L uh, tau and that L tau has an easy function of T, so we get T to the minus gamma over Z over nu, near a ferroelectric critical point, and since Z equals one and nu equals a half, we actually get two. So in both cases, we've been able to recover the Russian results. Okay, can we do something new? Well, let me just go through this quickly because I'd like to get beyond polar materials and tell you a little about ferroelectrics. So there's something called the Grunheisen relation, which is the uh, thermal expansion over specific heat. I can get this from a self-consistent Landau theory where I'm changing the polarization and the volume. Now, I, we can find that in this case, we're going to have the uh, Grunheisen will be related to the variance over the energy. Classically, the variance will just go like the inverse susceptibility, which goes like T. Of course, the energy goes like T. So near a classical phase transition, uh, we don't expect anything from the Grunheisen. The reason this Grunheisen is so nice is because distinguishing uh, inverse susceptibility of T square and T, you might say, well, you don't have enough decades. How do you know that you don't just have a, a, a low temperature classical transition? But the Grunheisen, as we'll see, acts very differently near classical transition and quantum transition. Okay, now Maybe, near a... Maybe, excuse me, there's a question here from Subic sure. And Shubik asks, is the current discussion applicable to uniaxial ferroelectrics? And if yes, how is the anisotropic scaling employed where QZ similar to QX squared? Uh, could you say that again, Pierce, please? Uh, it, is the current discussion applicable to uniaxial ferroelectrics? And yes. if so, then how is the anisotropic scaling employed in this case? Okay, thank you very much for the question. Yes, at the moment, I'm talking about uniaxial uh, ferroelectrics. As it turns out, in uniaxial ferroelectrics, uh, it was shown actually by Larkin and Kamenitsky, and most recently by Rusev and Millis, that the key role of the dipole interactions is to give you a gap to the for the longitudinal phonons. So all the critical 
phonons that I'll be talking about near the ferroelectric transition will be the transverse optical phonons. So after that, I'm not going to worry about the dipolar interactions. Okay, that's going to be the very simple uh, approach that I'm going to take now. And then we'll see that uh, this will, and, and we make contact with the experiment. So the dipolar interactions, as far as we're concerned, they may renormalize our parameters, but they're giving us a gap to the longitudinal phonons. Um, are there any other questions? I hope that addresses that, and I'm happy to discuss this more. Uh, near a d equals three for electric quantum critical point, we expect that the variance will go as the inverse of chi, uh, which we already know is t squared, and the energy now will go like t times the number of modes excited. And now remember, in the past, that was q times the Brillouin zone, Q, the Q Brion zone to the D, so there's no temperature dependence, but now we have QT to the D, okay? So now we have T to the fourth, so we expect one over T squared. And similarly, uh, we can get this from a scaling approach um, uh, to the Grunheisen. Now this has, uh, the Cambridge group has done wonder, a wonderful job of coming very, very close to the quantum critical point using uh, oxygen, uh, again, using um, oxygen 18, oxygen 16. Um, and again, it's a transverse optical mode that goes soft here. And they, do, they, do, uh, they are able to get extremely close and they're very good preliminary signs of the Grunheisen fitting this measurement. But you see that what we've done is we've exploited the fact that we're at the marginal dimension to use both self, uh, it's coming in from above using a simple self-consistent Lando theory and coming in from below using a scaling approach. Okay, now it turns out that there are many materials, including the poster child barium titanate, that if you apply pressure, you can drive it to what seems like a quantum critical point. We're still at the very early stages of looking at these systems, but one of the appeals experimentally is look at how, because these are compressible systems, one can get a tremendous temperature range for not that much pressure or chemical substitution. So that's something that is really very appealing about these systems. So why study quantum, critical, quantum criticality? We have quest for universality, of course, there are simple examples, few degrees of freedom and non-dissipative dynamics. They reside in the marginal dimension, allowing for detailed interplay between experiment and theory. And there are additional degrees of freedom that can be added systematically, spin and charge. Now there was a question, let's, I'm going to get to that, some open questions for future research, which maybe some of you will take. Of course, there's specific materials for study at low T, Adding spin, you can get a multi quantum critical point. Um, my colleague Sun Chang already has one of these. Uh, there are a number of, of predicted by uh, Nicholas Spalden. Uh, that could be quite interesting. Then you can add charge and you can get, and, and I'd like to uh, end our discussion today by talk, telling you about an, exo an unexpected exotic metal and superconductor. So I was asked about whether or not we can have ferroelectric, we can have a, a ferroelectric metal. So let's talk a little bit about what happens when we dope strontium titanate. The mod, what's the MOT criteria for doped semiconductors? The MOT criteria for doped semiconductors, which tells you when you have a metal, is you want the average donor distance to be of order the Bohr radius, okay, or some fraction of it. It turns out empirically that if we do that, then we get that the concentration to the one third, this is in 3D, times the effective Bohr radius is about a quarter. Now, the effective Bohr radius is the Bohr radius we all learned about, but here we have to measure, we have to include the dielectric constant, which in strontium titanate is large. So what's found is that if we look at Bohr radius versus carrier concentration, strontium titanate becomes a metal at very low carrier concentrations. Okay, 
Now, transport in N-doped strontium titanate. The resistivity goes as a constant plus a t squared, where this a, and we'll talk about this shortly, is a very strong, has a very strong concentration dependent. Now, if we look at rho versus t squared, and this is from a very nice recent review by Cameron Benia and his colleagues, um, look at this t dependence. It goes like t squared, and it's incredibly robust. Now, you might at first sight say, that's very nice. That's just Fermi liquid theory. That's just due to the fact that we have electron-electron scattering, and therefore, and we only have a certain amount of phase space for each near the Fermi surface, and therefore, we have T squared. But the point, the point is the Fermi energy here is about 10 degrees. We're shooting all the way up, okay? And it's very robust, okay? Now, what uh, Cameron and his colleagues did was they actually intentionally uh, irradiated this system to see how important disorder would be. As you see, it shifts the residual resistivity, but the slope just keeps on going. So one of the big questions is what's the origin of this robust T dependence? There are a number of suggestions in the community. Maybe we'll have a chance to talk about that next time. Now, this is, again, you notice that this is all relatively recent. This is from Suzanne Stemmer's group uh, at Santa Barbara. You can look at the concentration dependence of this A. You note that it's pretty uh, strongly dependent. And if you take a Druden model and you look at AT squared, this would go as 1 over N. And so some have suggested that if you believe that A goes as one over N, that this scattering time may be a universal quantity. But there are lots of things about just normal metal endope strontium titanate that we still don't understand. Now let's look a little bit at energy scales. The kinetic energy will go as the concentration to the two thirds. The Coulomb energy goes as n to the one third, but Rs here is very, very weak because of course the Bohr radius comes in and the, the uh, dielectric constant is very large. And so Rs is about 10 to the minus two, which means that in this system, we have very, very weak electron-electron interactions. Now let's just look at some numbers for concentration of about 10 to the 17 uh, per, per uh, cubic centimeter. We have a Fermi energy of about 13 degrees. We have a Debye energy of 400, okay? So our Fermi energy is much, is an order of magnitude less than our Debye energy. And what we have in these system, the system, which is quite different from what we usually have, is we have slow electrons and fast Phonons. As Sentel told us in his, uh, in his beautiful lecture yesterday, the microscopics are non-negotiable. So normally we have, I remind you that normally we have fast electrons and slow phonons. And that's what allows us to have electron-electron pairing in, for example, the conventional electron phonon view. But here we have slow electrons and fast phonons. Okay. And so the notion is, would you expect these electrons to actually interact attractively? How? Well, amazingly enough, in the 70s, Marvin Cohen looked at N-doped strontium titanate. And, with a, and at that point, the band structure wasn't known. And he had a lot of, uh, he had a lot of experience with other semiconductors that had multi valleys And based on that, he had, he predicted that if you lower the temperature of the system, that goes superconducting. Now, interesting enough, the band structure came in and it's not what- Excuse me, honey, yes. we have a question in the chat. Of course. Um, so the question from Yasha um, Kamijani is, um, sorry, I couldn't help noticing that the T squared slope changes with disorder. Is that significant? Where are the phonons? Okay, uh, we're back to this. Thank you, Yashar. Uh, yes, the slope, the slope may change a little. The, what, did, what was the question? The slope? 
um, the T squared slope changes with disorder. Yes, it changes a tiny bit with disorder. That's true. But the main point is it still scales with T squared. Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, phone uh, maybe a follow up question. So, so where are the phonons here? Or are, or are they coming in pair? Or is there, is there a reason that this is, uh, the, the contribution is not T linear? Uh, well, that's a good question. Um, as you know, there, there's a, a theory by um, Abhishek Kumar and Dmitry Maslov that suggests that two phonon interactions are very important in the system. And actually, they're able to explain this very nicely. Um, but uh, your question is very well posed. And uh, I think in their approach, the two phonon approach, uh, what happens, it's it, at high temperatures, they have a very nice explanation. There, the issue is at low temperatures, where you expect uh, below the uh, phonon frequency, you might expect at very low temperatures, um, you might expect exponential damping, and they don't see that. So, as this is still a very open question. Thank you. Um, I add that, of course, we are talking about electrical resistivity. Yes. And pho phonons do, of course, carry heat, but they don't have a charge. So, this question is perhaps not so important for this issue. Yes, that could be. That could be. Thank you, Hilbert. Um, are there any other questions? Okay, so uh, there is one more in this. Uh, oh, sure. That is now from Jorge uh, Quintanilla. Um, oh, hi, Jorge. Yes, sure. Jorge? Yeah. But I guess maybe it was more of a comment. But yeah, he says there's no T scale up to 100 Kelvin, which is a lot less than uh, the Debye frequency. There's no pardon? Yes, that's right. So okay. yeah, he says the temperature scale only goes to a fraction of the Debye frequency, basically. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Um, so Marvin Cohen predicted that it would go superconducting. Uh, it's an interesting case of the Cheshire cat smile because the theory that pushed him to nudge his experimental friends at Berkeley to do the measurement we know was based on a band structure that is not valid. However, they did see it go superconducting. So what we have is a system that's been known to be superconducting since the 70s, and yet we still don't understand it, okay? So let me just uh, end by showing you a little bit of recent data. This is again by the Cambridge group. We have temperature, and here we have oxygen 18. It goes ferroelectric here. What they find is a function of pressure if they have niobium doped strontium titanate and there are different ways of doping strontium titanate you can dope it with oxygen vacancies you can dope it with niobium you can dope it in many different ways what they find which is very interesting is you may recall that the quantum critical point is somewhere here and what they find is as they dope it and apply pressure to go closer to the quantum critical point the superconducting transition temperature goes up now, a similar kind of suggestion came from the NICE experiments by Dirk van der Merle's group. They looked at the isotope effect in strontium, in superconducting and strontium tightening. Now, this is a little tricky because, of course, you have two things going on. You are increasing the mass, okay? This is, the, it, this is on the oxygen, but you're also driving the system closer to the quantum critical point. And they measure the isotope effect and they find that actually TC increases as you make the system heavier. Uh, that's with oxygen 18 over oxygen 16. Whereas you would not expect that from a conventional BCS system. And so one of the outstanding questions is, do quantum critical fluctuations enhance superconductivity? Now, I remind you that the soft transverse optical phonons here are extremely weakly coupled to the charge density. There are plasmons, but there are, is much fine tuning required. And so what we want, and this is still an open question, is how to get S-wave isotropic Cooper pairing without retardation, okay? 
And that's something that's still very much an open question. Okay. Usually the way we get electrons to interact is either with retardation, that is with omega, or with K dependence. Okay. But here we have an isotropic system. We don't have restoration, but we definitely have superconductivity. So this is I, an open question. We have a question from Jorge. Sure, Jorge. Jorge? Jorge, unmute. So Jorge's raised his hand. Um, mute yourself. Um, unless his mic is not working. Can uh, he put it, can he type it? Jorge is unmuted now, but um, we can't hear him. So maybe you could type Jorge. Well, maybe while he's doing that, I'll just, I just, I'm almost at the end. So shall I just continue until his question comes up? Yeah, it yes, sounds like I, I think, I think so. Okay, so that's actually all that I had to say today. Um, so in, in the flavor of the streaming video systems like Netflix, let me tell you what's happening next time. Next time, which will be next Thursday, I'd like to give you a flavor for two current research projects. The first will address the question, can quantum fluctuations toughen a system against macroscopic instabilities resulting in a line of classical first order transitions ending in a quantum critical point? We've talked about the fact that classically most ferroelectrics are first order in their transition. And yet we have a number of experimental suggestions that we have quantum criticality or at least extremely weak first order behavior uh, as T goes to zero. Do we have a theoretical understanding of this? Uh, many years ago, um, as I mentioned before, ferroelectrics have strong electromechanical coupling. And many years ago, this sort of uh, coupling in a different context was considered by Larkin and Pickett, and one of the ideas here is to generalize their idea, their, what they did to the quantum case. Okay, that's number one. The second one, which is related to one of the questions, is when do metals close to polar quantum critical points develop strongly interacting novel phases? We know that metals near other quantum critical points can develop very interesting phases. Can this happen near a polar quantum critical point? And again, polar quantum critical point would be one where we have inversion symmetry breaking in such a way that if the system were insulating, we'd have a ferroelectric transition. So thank you very much. And I look forward to sharing more of my work with you next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Premi. Um, Jorge, did your question crop up? We seem to have lost Jorge completely. Okay, I'm crazy. sorry. He, um, yeah, we lost him. Okay, well, maybe he'll have a chance to ask next week then. Okay, are there any questions? We have a number. So, first of all, let's. Um, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. I can't Masori. hear you very oh, well. Has his hand raised, Monsieur? Perhaps first we can start with. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. I, I have a, a general question about the topics. So, and the, so I guess there are both the uh, similarity and the difference between the magnetically ordered material and the, the uh, ferro, ferro electric material. Yes. And the, could you emphasize the uh, a remarkable difference between them? And the, does it come from the uh, interplay between the elastic form or what is the main difference between them? Okay, well, uh, let's see. Um, so you would like to know about the difference between magnetic systems and ferroelectrics. First of all, as I understand from my experimental colleagues and the experimentalists here may, um, may, may add to this, there are not that many insulating magnetic materials that are studied close to quantum criticality. There are some, but there are not that many. Now, as I understand, a key difference between ferroelectrics and magnetic systems is that the dynamics in a ferroelectric are propagating 
okay? They're not dissipative, they're propagating. So in that sense, it's much easier. In most magnetic systems studied, the dynamics are more complicated. So that's a key difference. The other thing, as a result of that distinction in dynamics, as I understand it, most quantum critical magnetic systems are well above their upper critical dimension. And so one of the um, possible nice aspects of looking at ferroelectrics is that we can actually do dimensional tuning. In principle, we could make thin films and go below the upper critical dimension. Uh, and uh, you can also, of course, uh, study at the marginal dimension. So those are some of the similarities and differences. But if we really believe in universality at quantum criticality, which there are indications that there are some, then the more settings, the better. I think from an experimental system, from an experimentalist standpoint, uh, you can, because these are more compressible systems, you can apply um, much less pressure to get the same temperature range. But of course, it's important to study many different systems to understand this phenomenon. Hi, Jorge. Hi, I apologize. I, I, I got out because I changed the device because clearly the other one, the microphone wasn't working. So I find this very fascinating and particularly this um, alpha coefficient. I was just wondering, you said at the beginning of the talk that the isotope can be used to completely change the phase diagram for ferroelectricity. Yes. So I, I just wonder if you can say a little bit more. Uh, it seems to me that this alpha coefficient would be very hard to determine if when you change the isotope, the ferroelectricity TC is changing completely. And what, what would that mean? Well, that's a good question. Uh, so as you suggest, uh, when you're changing the isotope, what they did was they changed the isotope here. And of course, it's doing two things. It's increasing the mass, but it's also driving you towards this quantum critical point, okay? And mm -hmm. so the interpretation that, as I understand it, the uh, Vandermeer group gave is that perhaps, uh, perhaps the quantum critical fluctuations are enhancing the superconductivity. But it would be interesting to see what happens, and I don't believe these measurements have been done, if you were to do the isotope effect on one of the other atoms, I don't have a feeling for how, uh, how uh, easy or difficult that is, just to separate the two. Thank you. I had another question, if I may. Of course. Uh, you said at the beginning that there was, even though ferroelectrics were very important in the study of criticality, yes, very late to quantum criticality. Is there a risk for this? I mean, obviously it exists. So why did it take so long? Well, I think Rousseff and Millis in the modern ideas of quantum criticality were the first to go back at, to the Russian papers. And I think to some extent they were motivated by the experiments of the Cambridge group. Um, as I'm, I mentioned, most ferroelectrics are studied for their room temperature properties. And it's probably more of a cultural question than anything else. The um, ferroelectrics are studied for specific applications, and there are many of them. And not that many people knew about these Russian papers. Uh, what Rusev and Millis did was, and again, I, as I understand, it was motivated by hearing about some of the Cambridge measurements, was they went back to some of these Russian papers and re-derived the results um, using a modern approach. And it's really the resurgence of these experiments that has brought them back, brought all of this back. But I think it's very important to realize that people were interested in this long before. And, you know, it's just that now we have experiments to connect with. I, I also, by the Thank way, you. find find it amazing if you look, these papers are 6971. There's, I mean, now we know about marginal dimensionality and all of that, but it's clear that there was a lot of knowledge, particularly in the Soviet Union, of ideas that we usually ascribe to, um, to the London and later the Cornell group. So there were a lot of parallel developments going on at the same time. Okay, Premi, we have a couple of questions in the chat and then one more hand raised. So in the chat we have from Peter Baker, 
would there be any interesting consequences of this quantum criticality in systems with magnetoelectric coupling? Uh, absolutely. And in fact, my colleague Sang Chung has been interested in looking at multiferroic quantum criticality. And that's just beginning to be studied. Sasha Bolotsky and Nicholas Falden have done a very nice analytic uh, computational treatment of multiferroic quantum critical points. I would say this is all just beginning. And then a more technical question from Rebecca Smith. How come in the barium strontium iron, uh, iron 12019 hexaferrite, which is a uniaxial ferroelectric, um, they get an ex, um, Rowley's group gets an exponent of three, not two. I thought the exponent of two was only for pseudo cubic systems rather than systems that have a high C over A tetragonality, but exponent of three in the latter. Perhaps Rebecca would like to unmute um, to, to discuss this with you, Jeremy. Uh, sure. Um, I know that uh, this is this is a certainly a very interesting measurement. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't remember the particulars of it, but it's believed it was expected to make contact with uh, the prediction. It didn't. That's of course what makes life much more interesting. One of the questions, if I remember right is there may be some anisotropy there uh, beyond just being a uniaxial ferroelectric that may need to be taken into account. Um, I don't know the details of why it didn't fit completely at this stage. But it's certainly a fascinating question. And of course, it makes life much more interesting when the experiment does not fit the theory. I'm always a little bit worried when it fits too well. Um, Stephen's still online, so may correct me. Um, uh, I've yes. just finished a PhD with Jim Scott. Um, oh, sure. So quantum criticality was what I ended up doing as a PhD subject because Jim okay. gave me three, two compounds, go and make them and analyze them, um, as you do. Um, so I thought the theory was, the theory you're reporting seems to be if it was pseudo qubit. By that, I mean that C direction, as in the A and B directions are roughly, are equal to each other. Yes. And the C direction is very, very similar to the A, B direction, but not identical. Whereas in the hexaferrites, I think if I remember rightly, the chemistry, so that's seven angstroms in the A, B direction, and it's 28 in the C, but don't okay. hold to that. That's off the top of my head. Um, and that's why um, the old Russian papers predicted a T to the three, an exponent of three, which I wondered why it didn't come out of your derivation, if that makes sense. Would it be I, I a case guess, of taking a limit somewhere? Yes, I guess what, thank you, Rebecca. And of course, um, we all miss Jim terribly. He was a wonderful, wonderful yeah. influence in this area. Um, I, I don't know the specifics, specifics of that. I was, uh, the paper, uh, of course, I didn't have time to go through all of the different Russian papers and the, the paper that you're referring to came a little later than the register paper. I just wanted to show how, um, how the susceptibility in a uniaxial case where you have the C direction very different and the A and B direction similar um, should scale. And I th if I remember right, the material you're discussing is slightly different from that as you suggest, it's pseudocubic. So, no, Pseudocubic is you get an exponent of two, yes. which, and the hexaferrites are uniaxial or hugely tetragonal. Oh yes, in, yes, yes. So that's why you. That's why, from my understanding, you get an exponent of three. Um, and I can't remember. Stephen at one point did send me all the links to the Russian papers, which Jim, being Jim, could find. Um, yes, yes. Um, and I know that he had a discussion with Dima Kamenitsky, who's at Cambridge also on why it didn't fit. Um, one of the issues that crops up is domains. There are all kinds of issues that could crop up. So I don't know the details of that, but again, I always think it makes it more interesting. Okay. There's, there's lots of work to be done. Thank you, Rebecca. We have a question from Navinder Singh. Navinder, if you could um, unmute yourself. 
Yeah. Uh, yes. So my question is related to uh, this T square resistivity. Yes. Uh, yeah. So so a couple of years ago, uh, so there was a paper published uh, related to this T square resistivity from this Cameron Mahania group. And yes. So they argued that uh, this resistivity uh, uh, is uh, difficult to explain theoretically because T square resistivity can come from, come from Bauer mechanism of electron electron spectrum. Yes. There are two reservoirs. And uh, and then uh, the other mechanism for T square resistivity is uh, uh, this uh, umclap processes. Uh, yes. Where they, yeah. So so they argued that because uh, this is a very low uh, density system, so that is also not operative. So is there an, any update on uh, uh, on the mechanism of T square resistivity in these materials? Because I have not followed the literature after that. Uh, what I, are your understanding I, of resistivity? I think it's still very much of an open question and thank you for summarizing this and of course uh, you're mentioning the papers by Cameron Benny and this is a review by by him as I understand it there's a very um, interesting idea I don't think it's yet published by Kumar Abhishek Kumar and Dmitry Maslov that suggests that uh, two phonon scattering may be a way of understanding this T squared uh, resistivity, they have to assume a universal scattering uh, scattering time, which means that going back to, uh, well, let's see, going back to, sorry, I have to, I'm not very good at this, going back to this, they want to assume that A goes as 1 over N, and this scattering time is universal, and then they look at the two phonon scattering. As far as I can tell, theirs is the best, is, is the most uh, compelling theory at the moment for understanding it, okay. but there are some issues at low temperatures there. Okay, thank you. I'll look into the paper. Thank you very much. I, I don't know if it's published yet. I know that they gave talks I at see. APS meetings, but it's a very I interesting see, okay. idea. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay, Premier, we, we have a question in the chat from Shuvik. Uh, actually, Shuvik, if you want to ask your question, I know you had your hand raised for a while. So you can ask your question in person or I can read it out. Hi, uh, Prema. Hi. Nice job. Thank uh, you. I have a somewhat nice question. So uh, how is the upper critical dimension data calculated here? Like how, how do we know the upper critical dimension is three plus one? Okay, so we didn't actually calculate it. Um, the four, four, the okay for the Larkin Kamenitsky theory, they they've been looking at a five four theory. There we know that the uh, that that d equals four is the crucial number. Okay, now in what we did here, the only thing I can tell you is let me go back. Do you remember when we did this? Mm -hmm. This is telling us in some sense what the upper critical dimension is. Okay, because d plus z has to be greater than four. Okay. To do this calculation classically is ironically a little bit harder because you have more temperature dependent terms, but you can do that. I see. But in the in the Larkin Kamenitsky paper, they know that they knew that for a uniaxial ferroelectric, it can be described by a 5-4 theory. There we know that the upper critical dimension is four. Um, and so they that, that's why they did their calculation there. I see, and, and, and small d here is three. That's right. And z is one here. Because but, for, for a fair electric, z is equal to one. And the, yeah. Yeah, the reason I got confused is because in the Larkin paper, they also talk, say, you know, one of the conclusion is that the z direction scales twice faster than x or y. That, that's right. So and then so, how, how do you have d plus z as a, I mean, Okay, so here I'm, uh, here I'm just looking at the spatial, here I'm just looking at spatial. I'm not worried about them at the moment. I see. Okay. Oh. Okay. And in, in what I'm talking about at, at low temperatures, the dipolar interactions are only important in giving me a gap to the longitudinal phonons. I'm not considering the dipolar interactions. I Whereas see. what Larkin and Kamenitsky did was they showed that the dipolar interactions gave them an additional uh, dimension. I see. Okay. Does that clarify? Yes, yes, thanks. Oh, thank you. 
Hey, Premi, we, um, Sam Carr wanted to ask you a question, but can't raise his hand because he's one of the hosts. Oh, so sure. Sam, if you'd like to ask your question. Please. Oh, yeah, thanks for a great talk, Premi. Um, Thank you. I had two questions. So firstly, I just wanted to check if I understood the undoped um, strontium titanate. Um, actually, even though it's not quantum critical and it's not ferroelectric, actually showed quantum fluctuations for really quite a large temperature range to get yes. this I as one over T squared behavior. Yes. Um, okay, so that is correct because I just, um, I hadn't appreciated that before. But yes, um, and, in, and in fact, what's interesting there is you might ask, wait a minute, there's nothing light in strontium titanate. It's not like helium. Why are quantum fluctuations so important? And my colleague David Vanderbilt and his colleagues showed um, that <clears> in fact, you have two competing states. You have an anti-ferroid distortive state and you have a ferroelectric state. And if it weren't for quantum fluctuations, it would become ferroelectric. But the quantum fluctuations, when you have two competing states that are very close in energy, the quantum fluctuations can make a difference. All right, thanks. Cool. That's, I mean, it's really interesting that even the undoped thing shows these things, this. Um, um, yes. Yeah, and that we need to understand this full phase diagram for. But actually, my other question was, there's a lot of interest just now in multiferroic yes. um, for obvious technological applications and yes. things. And um, it sounds like if uh, you started looking at quantum critical properties of these, there, it might be very, very rich. Is anybody doing this? Well, they're actually Nicholas Baldwin and Sasha Bolotsky have been doing that. And that's been a very nice combination of analytic and computational efforts. And what they've done is they've actually made some predictions uh, for strained and doped europium titanate, which should show a multiferroic quantum critical point. And this combination of doing analytics and, and computational is wonderful for making specific predictions of materials. There is one material that Sang Chong, my colleague, has looked at but as far as I know, this is very uncharted territory and it's very rich, I believe. I also think it could be very interesting for magnetoelectric caloric cooling. Um, I mentioned that there are possible applications. Uh, people interested in satellites are interested in low temperature behavior of ferroelectrics because of being cosmically hard. But there's also an effort. <coughs> it would be wonderful if one could come up with cooling that would be competitive with magnetic cooling that wouldn't require all the coils and everything like that. And so there have been suggestions about doing something like this near magnetic quantum critical point. And actually you would ideally you would want a magnetic or ferroelectric quantum tri-critical points. So you could get the entropy and the, the long wavelength. And that's, a, you know, application. So I, Part of all of this is just to make sure that, um, to give you an idea of the richness is possible. Cool, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Premi, for a fantastic talk and for answering all of the questions.